I, th- I don't think it would be too strong to say that the scientific community was humiliated by this pandemic because they realized that they got it wrong. On the morning of March 1918, a mess cook at Camp Funston in Kansas, Albert Gitchell, reported to the infirmary with a sore throat. By lunchtime, the infirmary was dealing with more than a hundred similar cases, and in the weeks that followed, so many reported sick that the camp's chief medical officer requisitioned a hangar to accommodate them all. We're going to have a conversation today about a dreadful disease, but it's more than just the story of that disease that we're going to discuss with Laura Spinney, the author of Pale Rider, the Spanish Flu of 1918, and how it changed the world. We're going to talk about a bit about politics and science as well, so I'm very excited. Laura Spinney is a science journalist and a literary novelist. She has published two novels in English, and her writing on science has appeared in National Geographic, Nature, The Economist, The Telegraph, among others. She is the author of The Pale Rider, The Spanish Flu of 1918, and How It Changed the World. And she joins me on the podcast. Laura, thanks for coming on. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. It's a pleasure to be here. In 1918, the world was greeted with a unkind, invisible visitor, uh, an incredibly strong virus that we now commonly refer to as the Spanish flu. The scale was so global, it reached Americans and Africans, Spanish and Chinese, Brazilians and Russians, even Eskimos uh, were affected. Uh, Could you talk about how strong it was and how fast it spread? Sure. The Spanish flu killed, according to the latest estimates, between 50 and 100 million people in the world, uh, which equates to roughly 2.5 to 5 percent of the global population. That's a large range. And and the reason is that there's still a lot that's unknown about the flu and that diagnosis at the time was was pretty vague. But it gives you a fairly good idea of how uh, dangerous it was. And to set those numbers in context, The previous flu pandemic, which was the Russian flu of the 1890s, killed around one million people. Mm -hmm. Um, And the most lethal pandemic that we had in the 20th century post the Spanish flu uh, was the Hong Kong flu, the so-called Hong Kong flu of 1968, which is thought to have killed around four million people. So it really was in a league of its own. And therefore, can us as moderns even begin to understand the, the, the impact that uh, that this disease had? That's a question that can be taken in, in lots of different ways, I suppose. I mean, we, the evidence is that we can't understand it or, or that we couldn't mm-hmm. at the time because we seem to have forgotten about it. So, so the Spanish flu struck at a time when even doctors barely understood the concept of a virus, influenza obviously being a viral disease. Almost all the doctors in the world thought that it was a bacterial disease. And most people in the world were only recently acquainted with germ theory. That is the idea that germs, bacteria and other microorganisms cause disease. It's important to take your mind back a century and understand that a lot of people still thought of this as um, an act of God, as something they could do nothing about, um, a punishment for sins, something to be endured and not to be prevented or cured. Um, and, And that actually... Um, coordinated pretty well with the facts because there was very little you could do about uh, influenza um, in those days, uh, even ordinary influenza, let alone a virulent one like this. Just remember that there were no antibiotic drugs and what most victims of the Spanish flu died of were not the flu itself, but secondary complications, mainly bacterial pneumonia. Uh, There were no antivirals. Those arrived even later in the clinic than antibiotics, so around the 1960s. And there certainly was no flu vaccine. So the only thing that really made any difference um, in saving lives was careful nursing, making sure that the patient was kept hydrated and warm and and uh, uh, fed. And um, apart from that, there was and some public health measures which could make a difference. 
there was very little that doctors could do. So the impact was horrendous, as the numbers suggest. And it even, uh, you know, there was very little other than, as you say, nursing and milk. Uh, they suggested, you know, the drinking of milk, and then milk supplies would run out, and the staff of nurses would would run out as some of them get the flu. Uh, William Carlos Williams, the poet and doctor, talks about how many in his profession were getting this flu. It was just so strong that it starts to impact the providers as well. Absolutely, and I certainly don't want to give the impression that doctors uh, and nurses and ordinary people didn't do their utmost to try and help the sick and, and the dying. They tried everything, literally everything. Some of their remedies were very uh, outlandish indeed. Uh, even in Switzerland, which you might think of as a fairly advanced country, people were sort of lighting aromatic fires in front of their homes to clear the, the noxious air. And that that's an idea that harks back to the Middle Ages when people thought that noxious air or miasma caused disease. So that gives an indication both of how desperate they were, how few effective interventions they had to hand, and also how scared they were. You uh, have a line in the book that you say, this flu hit in a time of quantum physics and also witches, where automobiles were available, but horses were still being used as transportation. Quite a world for such an advanced disease to hit. Yes, exactly. And I mean, you could always describe the planet as um, sort of torn between pre-modern and modern ages, depending on your definition of modern. But it was a, a real turning point between um, a sort of more mystical age, pre-Darwinian age, uh, and a more scientific uh, post-Darwinian age. I mean, Darwin was writing about his revolutionary ideas uh, more than half a century earlier, but obviously... Uh, such ideas take a long time to trickle down to the ordinary man or woman. And uh, let's get this Spanish thing out of the way. <laughs> it's uh, called the Spanish flu, but, uh, you know, that's just one of these things that that seems to be so common. You know, uh, uh, the, the people will say that the Dutch treat and things like this. We're always naming things after someone who is not us. Uh, is that is that what happened? It's not really Spain. Where As you gathered, it's, it's, an, it's a misnomer. Um, we, we always like to blame the other person. And uh, as I've already said, people really didn't know where this disease came from. They had to blame someone. Um, the reason it was blamed on the poor old Spanish, uh, who really had nothing to do with its origins, were, was that um, was politics, really. Spain was neutral in the war. Um, and so unlike the hostile nations, it didn't censor its press. Um, and it wrote about the flu when it experienced its first cases. It reported on those cases, and among them was um, the king of Spain, whose case was obviously very visible. So uh, that story appeared in the newspapers. People read about it in Spain and abroad, and it seemed to the rest of the world that the flu was sort of rippling out from Madrid, and that's how it caught that name, um, when in fact it had been in the States, uh, certainly, and probably in Britain and France uh, much earlier. And um, in in our memory, to the extent there is any knowledge of the Spanish flu, it's taught often as an adjunct uh, to World War One. It's still somewhat tempting for uh, folks like myself, you know, man of peace, and and I'd like to give World War One one more impact to 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 urge the caution of war because things like this can happen. Uh, but, uh, you do cast some doubt on that, whether the, uh, perhaps, um, the war was the factor that caused the influenza or, or whether it was something that just would have happened in any case. Well, well, let's say that we haven't quite worked out the entire mechanisms of why the Spanish flu erupted when it did or why it was so virulent, so much more virulent than any other flu pandemic in the history of humanity. Um, but it does look as if um, the war had something to do with it in this sense. Um, new strains of flu virus occasionally spill over from other animal species into the human species mm. and cause a pandemic. Uh, we have had flu, flu pandemics outside of wartime. But the current thinking is that it was the sort of synergy of that event um, and the First World War that created such a lethal pandemic in 1918. And certainly there was something very anomalous about it, 50 to 100 million dead compared to 1 million dead in the pandemic that happened uh, 20 years earlier, though the global population hadn't increased very much more, uh, is something that needs to be explained. Um, 
the thinking at the moment is that um, the flu emerged into a world that was in a very un, uh, exceptional state. That is, it was at war. Large amounts of people were experiencing famine. Large, amount, large amounts of people were um, displaced and on the move. Um, and in the trenches of um, the Western Front in Europe, uh, lots of young men um, in a fairly lamentable physical state were packed together, their lungs compromised by gas, uh, by mustard gas and other things. Um, and they made very easy targets for a novel respiratory disease. And they also provided um, an unusual situation for that virus because it's often said that the best strategy in evolutionary terms for a virus is to moderate its virulence so that its hosts stay alive for long enough to travel and spread it further. Mm. But in this case, that wasn't possible because uh, if you think of it reaching the trenches of the Western Front, those men were packed together into trenches. They weren't very mobile at all. Uh, uh, they were dying of other things before they could die of flu, name, mainly flying bullets. So in that sort of very unusual situation, it might have been a better evolutionary strategy for the virus to be extremely virulent and uh, kill its hosts fast and spread through them uh, without worrying about how long they stayed alive. When I say worry, I obviously don't mean that this virus has a strategy in the conscious sense, mm. um, but that's the best way that it will survive and go on to reproduce, which is um, what you might call a, an evolutionary strategy. Um, so that might be one explanation for why it was so virulent um, and why uh, the Western Front may have contributed to the sort of ratcheting up of that virulence and then to the spread of a very virulent strain once um, the armistice was signed and those men were demobilized and the survivors went back to the four corners of the earth where they were uh, welcomed at uh, homecoming parties by joyous crowds of civilians. And it's uh, interesting what you, you, you say that, that the, uh, the, a virus has no conscience, a virus has no thought, it doesn't have any politics, it doesn't plan anything, but everything around it, uh, that, and the steps that we take, you know, do contain the political consequences. The, the virus, in a sense, might render things visible. One of them is, uh, an additional impact of war, more deaths than the World War. One itself and, uh, almost approaching, a, you know, just, just a matter of the estimates not being clear, the, the deaths of, of World War II. I think that's a very important point. When we think about the danger of future pandemics, uh, we tend to focus on the virus itself. Where will it come from? How will we contain it? And that sort of thing. We very rarely or, or we're less likely to look at the role of the interaction with the host. What kind of a world will it merge into? Uh, what are the inequalities in this world in terms of healthcare and um, access to medicine and social status and wealth and diet and so on uh, that will have an impact on how fast that virus travels across the world, how virulent it will be, and how many people will die ultimately? I think that often with the advances in being able to identify a virus and to see things that we were unable to see even at the time that these people existed in. We've sort of become fascinated with that process and necessarily so in understanding viral mechanisms. But I do find it's interesting that maybe on the political science side that uh, the interest in that sort of thing, there's always political support for building the best laboratory and the best medical university and the knowledge. And, and there's there's a lot of sort of bipartisan and all partisan support for that. But when it comes to public health measures, those are, are not often saluted as well. Viruses like this must be must be around or or have or or their potential must be there, but we haven't had such an outbreak. Absolutely. And I mean if you think about uh the fact that we now have a flu vaccine, the vaccine is getting better every year. Um and that's in itself is not a is no mean feat because the vaccine has to evolve in order to match the evolving flu virus. Um, but uh, our best protection in the case of a future flu pandemic is going to be high herd immunity. The fact that um, uh, a good proportion of the population is vaccinated against that disease, and that involves two elements. The first is having a, an effective flu vaccine, and the second is making sure that enough people are, uh, receive it. And people won't, um, you know, 
First of all, we have to make sure that enough people have access to the vaccine, but we also have to ensure that those people are informed about what it can do for them, that it's not dangerous, uh, or that the risks out, uh, the benefits outweigh the risks. And they have to be, um, they have to trust the people who are telling them this. Um, so there's a, there's a, an issue of medical education, of public education, which is almost as important as the, as the And rest. you would be a proponent, go and get the flu vaccine. I absolutely would. And not just for yourself and your family, but for, for society at large. It's very important to understand a flu pandemic is not just a biological phenomenon, but a social one, as I hope my book shows. I want to talk a bit about the, 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 go back to a bit about the 2019 and how, just how far it spread. I mean, we talked about that even some communities like the Luton Islands, the Eskimos, that there, there were, there were thoughts that, oh, well, they, they won't, be hit by this. The Chinese, you know, though they're, they're f- so far away from the Western Front, say, I believe Australia tries to, a quarantine policy and maybe has some minimal success. Uh, some s- towns in Spain try quarantines and, and are as, as successful as they're able to accomplish it. Um, yeah, I wish you would talk a bit about how far around the globe uh, this virus spread. So, so it's funny because um, uh, if, if you look at the photos related to the pandemic that circulate on the web and in the press, um, you know, a- anyone would think that it only affected uh, uh, America or, or, and Europe um, and even more narrowly one sort of military camp in the Midwest. Uh, unfortunately, that we don't have many uh, photographs from that time relevant to the pandemic. But the fact is that it infected the entire globe uh, with very few exceptions. Um, I think St. Helena at the Atlantic was one of them. There's an island in the Amazon. Uh, almost nowhere escaped. Um, Australia was an interesting case because seeing the second wave, that of the autumn, the North, Northern Hemisphere autumn of 1918 wave, uh, approach across time and space, um, the, this, this wave being the most lethal of the three, um, they put in place a maritime Quarantine. So all the ships arriving at Australian ports were, were quarantined before their personnel crew were allowed to land. And that kept that autumn wave out of Australia, which was an amazing accomplishment, really. Unfortunately, the Australians lifted the quarantine uh, after the, North, the autumn wave had passed. Um, and so the third wave of the pandemic, um, which arrived in the following January, January 1919, we're talking about, did get into Australia. It was not as virulent as the autumn wave, um, but it still claimed uh, around 12,000 Australian lives. It was global and almost nowhere escaped. And in fact, the more isolated regions um, were, were almost always the most vulnerable, uh, probably because of lack of historical exposure to the flu. And so their immune systems, the immune systems of people in those places weren't primed. But often in those places, there was also poor access to health care, uh, more poverty, social exclusion, and those sorts of problems just exacerbated the ones caused by isolation. And you, you gave the example of Eskimos, um, Alaska, which was at the time uh, a U.S. territory, not a full state, was quite badly affected. Um, the worst affected region was Bristol Bay, which lost a staggering 40% of its population. So although the the, the United States as a whole uh, got off relatively lightly, um, there were parts of it that were very badly affected indeed. And a reminder to my listeners that I'm speaking with Laura Spinney, the author of Pale Rider, The Spanish Flu of 1918 and How It Changed the World. Two of the revelations of the book, one that you, you get beyond what's available through the evidence of photography and talk about the, the world uh, and how, how far this uh, disease reached. And secondly, talk about the, the number of waves. Um, it wasn't just one and then, oh, good, we dodged it. It's over. The, this thing sort of came yeah, back. Yeah, it took the world by surprise. So in terms of timings, I'll talk about the northern hemisphere because obviously the seasons work differently uh, below the equator. But in the northern hemisphere, the uh, Spanish flu first emerged uh, in the spring of um, 1918. Um, that first wave was relatively mild, um, not much to distinguish it from uh, a seasonal flu. It receded in the early summer of 1918, um, and uh, most of that summer was flu-free. 
Uh, but when it came back in the last days of August, early September, it was uh, almost unrecognizable. It seemed to people to be a completely other disease. They, they were, there were even comparisons with the Black Death. Mm-hmm. It was very much more lethal. This was the, the second autumn wave, which uh, receded towards the end of the year. And then there was a third wave in the um, spring, early months of 1918, which was sort of intermediate between the other two in terms of virulence. This world, uh, you know, we are on, uh, we're talking about 1918, we're on the cusp of uh, modernity. Things are starting to get automated, electricity, automobiles. Yeah, talk about perhaps the impact of this disease on fostering science, if that occurred. Absolutely, it occurred. I, I mean, the the I, th- I don't think it would be too strong to say that the scientific community was humiliated by this pandemic because they realized that they got it wrong. Um, virology took off in the years following the pandemic. Uh, the concept, the first viruses were discovered in the closing days of the uh, 19th century, but um, they didn't really take up much psychic space by 1918. Most diseases were um, were blamed on bacteria most infectious diseases. Uh, even old age was being blamed on bac- bacteria by the time uh, the Spanish flu came along. Um, when they saw that their vaccines, which were um, antibacterial, were almost completely ineffective, um, doctors went to work, went back to the drawing board, if you like. Um, and e- even in the, in, the, in the midst of the pandemic, they were making experiments to see if perhaps they'd been wrong about a bacterial cause and trying to find if there was something else, something smaller, because viruses are in general smaller than bacteria, that might have been the true cause. Um, It wasn't until the 1930s that they definitively proved that, um, demonstrated that flu was caused by a virus. But uh, it was definitely the Spanish flu that stimulated that. And in fact, Jonas Salk, who famously uh, developed the polio vaccine, he became interested in viruses in, in those post-Spanish flu years when all the virologists of his generation in his home city, New York, were trying to solve the mystery of the Spanish flu. Check out www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com for articles on the Spanish flu of 1918 and a link to Laura Spinney's book. And it's uh, interesting, yes, in, in plagues and viruses of past. I'm thinking of something we talked about on on this program in the past is the Philadelphia yellow fever of 1793 because it coincided with the beginnings of the early American Republic and almost devastated members of that government. Um, it, it, it's 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 on our minds, and you know there there's certainly. Uh, during that time, it was a lot of um, blaming it on morality. There was a preacher saying, see, you allowed actors and theaters in Philadelphia, and now look what God has wrought. I'm sure there were some of that in 1918. Do you have any sense of it, it kind of in the history of that time, and, and maybe it's it's not something that we have but that we can get a grasp of, but of of the battle between hey this disease is is based on the morality and all those things we we hear quite often and and the science and saying okay we've got to figure out how to deal with this scientifically was was the science side starting to win there and and the other mostly being left off in 1918 or was it still a struggle well i think it's an excellent question is is science ever really free of of political thought or, or cultural bias, uh, should we look at ourselves today and ask ourselves that question? Back in 1918, it certainly wasn't. At that time, uh, eugenics was very much a mainstream school of thought, and um, a lot of uh, powerful people in the world, and even less powerful people, and a lot of doctors, um, believed firmly that um, Darwin's ideas are played, uh, applied to human societies as well, and that... Um, some human beings were, were stronger and more destined uh, 
to survive than others, and that the ones that were at the bottom of the pile um, were, were doomed to die of dangerous infectious diseases, among other causes, because they had um, they were inherently inferior, and there was nothing you could do about that. Mm. Um, so yes, uh, that whole eugenics. I don't want to call it a philosophy. I don't want to dignify it with that name because obviously it was thoroughly discredited uh, later on. But it was a school of thought that was extremely influential and that colored uh, immigration policies. It colored uh, public health policies. There was a, a sort of an idea that that um, the superior classes needed to be separated from the inferior ones in order not to be uh, contaminated with their diseases. Yeah, I mean, I think often where it's it's science versus non-science, but it's also favoring certain areas of science politically. It could be dangerous as well. You were we often, I think, fall in love with whatever is the current theory. You were talking about how uh, they were once the germ theory of disease had reached its its apex and it was understood and and not laughed at anymore. Then you started getting the extension of it. Oh, old age is caused by Sometimes I wonder about our, our our current love for DNA and the microbiome is becoming so so large now. You know, you'll wonder how far it's going to go to, to if, if we start favoring policies towards towards those things that we can we just know now and and not what we might have known. I think that that one of the main lessons of the Spanish flu was that with the scientists was that um, you need to um, experiment. You need to put your faith in the evidence. You need to always ask questions. Uh, you need to uh, always question your own prejudices. And you need to be open to new ideas and new theories. I think it's the nature of science that it swings between um, extremes until it finds, uh, you know, as more evidence is accumulated. So genes were all the rage. Then uh, previously in the environment was all the rage in terms of contribution to, to many types of disease today. Now we realize that most diseases are a combination of the two. Uh, everything is more complex than it seems to be at the beginning. Um, and we just have to be open and keep working hard and collecting the evidence. That's the only way that science is going to advance. Let's talk a bit about the H1N1. This is the, the, I saw that in your book, like this, the disease we're talking about, the, the Spanish flu. And I feel so bad about repeating it, but there's no other way to identify it and have people understand. Yeah, it's in the, it's in the history books. We have to now. resign ourselves to that. Uh, it, it is, uh, the H1N1, it, it is, is it not? It's the H1N1, yeah. It's, um. And that's similar to what hit us in, in uh, uh, you know, not too long ago. So, so the, the the taxonomy of flu is a little hard to get your head around. It's exactly mm-hmm. the same subtype, uh, but it's a different strain. Um, as okay. I said, uh, flu flu is a very light, labile virus. It changes all the time, changes its genetic makeup. Um, but they're very closely related strains. Yes. The the swine flu. It's it's related, but so so the the reason it didn't have the same impact. It, it was a little scary. But not the same impact was maybe some of the virulence and then also public health measures, I suppose. Yeah, um, that 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 a lot of the flus that have been circulating in the human population over over the last hundred years share a lot of genes. So, um, uh, you know, our immune systems, the immune systems of everyone alive, probably have some uh, priming towards them, and that's why they, perhaps it, one of the reasons, perhaps why why. Uh, the 2009 pandemic was less uh, virulent than we might have expected. We have the flu vaccine now. We have antiviral drugs. Uh, we tend to be, on, on average, better fed than, than we were then. Uh, all sorts of reasons. Um, and, and just in general, medical knowledge is much better. But um, what's interesting is is that in, in 1918, I mean, why is why was the 2009 pandemic called swine flu? It was a human disease. Um the reason was that um, it goes back to ni- 1918, in fact, because in 1918, there was a simultaneous uh, epidemic of flu in pigs. And mm-hmm. we now know that that, that that was also caused by H1N1, but it was a new disease in pigs. And, and we now know that it was humans that infected pigs, not the other way around. That virus then circulated in pig populations in the world uh, through the 20th century. And in 2009, it reemerged in a slightly modified form in humans. So it may have come from pigs, but in fact, it was originally a human disease. 
How arrogant we are as uh, humans, you know. We here we are blaming the pigs, and it is us that uh, infected them. We owe them an apology of sorts. You know? well, we owe pigs an apology. We definitely do. And, and I think we have a tendency to think of ourselves as sort of, um, you know, uh, surrounded by a dangerous natural world, and, and not to think of ourselves as part of that world. We very much are part of that bigger flu ecosystem. Besides the flu vaccine, um, what? What fights flu today? What are what are steps that uh, and and policies that you could think of that a good good government, either local or federal, does? Well, I think I think it starts now. That is, with no pandemic on the horizon, although we don't usually get much warning, um, with education mm. uh, and with uh, inoculation. Um, People have to understand that the flu vaccine is the best protection we have in the face of a future pandemic and not to wait until that pandemic explodes. Because um, uh, although the strain may be different from the one uh, of vaccines that are available now, there's likely to be some overlap. And uh, everything is priming your um, immune system against flu. It's better than nothing. Um, and the more people who are vaccinated, should a pandemic arise, the fewer people will die globally. Um, so it starts with education. It starts with inoculation. Uh, we we have much more in our sort of tool cabinet, if you like, for uh, after the fact, for if for once the pandemic does explode, we've got antiviral drugs, we've got antibiotic drugs. Um, and, and, and apart from that, and again, good nursing, um, a lot of the things that were effective when they were implemented properly in 1918 are also things that are going to help um, today or tomorrow in the next pandemic. So uh, public health measures that are collectively known as social distancing, basically, they just keep people apart so that um, so that the virus can't spread. Uh, you could think of the flu vaccine as a social distancing measure because what it does is it protects one person so that person can't carry the, the virus to the next. Um, but it also covers things like um, the banning of mass gatherings, the wearing of protective masks, um, isolation, quarantine, advice to stay in your home uh, and, and to, you know, um, not go out if you can possibly avoid it until the danger is passed. Those uh, government-imposed measures sometimes people chafe at, but, you know, it's necessary to have some kind of uh, uh, controlling authority to get on that early. Uh, I know that there are examples in your book of operas, uh, carnivals, uh, the carnival in Brazil, uh, just these events that occurred along the time of the flu and were, 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 were you know, not good timing. The yeah, I, I mean, just to go back to your, to your previous point, people do chafe at these measures. People, especially today, much more than in 1918, don't like the state and authorities intervening in their lives and telling them what to do, um, uh, and, and that's perfectly reasonable. But um, obviously, these measures are for our collective good. Uh, the authorities do also know that we don't like to be ordered to do things, and they know that it's much better if we do it voluntarily. That's been proven again and again. So uh, once again, that's why it's important that people are educated, people understand why these measures are imposed and that it's for everybody's benefit. The Rio Carnival is a fascinating example of how people reacted to the Spanish flu because um, it was held in uh, well, around Mardi Gras, of course, in February 1919. Um, and uh, the, the epidemic was all but, all but over in Rio de Janeiro by then. But death was a very recent memory, and people were just sort of realizing how lucky they were to be alive. It was the biggest carnival on record until that date. Um, and uh, the people who attended it essentially went crazy from the, uh, from the, from the eyewitness testimonies that, they, that we have. Um, it um, turned into a sort of orgy of joy and the fact that I'm still alive. Um, people were celebrating. The party went on for days. Uh, they couldn't believe that they'd come through this um, this terrible event. And uh, there was a sort of darker side to it too, in the sense that it looks like um, there were a lot of um, rapes in the context of that carnival. And nine months later, a generation of children were born who were known as the sons of flu. My guest has been Laura Spinney, a science journalist and literary novelist and the author of The Pale Rider, Spanish Flu of 1918, and How It Changed the World. Uh, Laura, thanks very much for coming on the program. It's my pleasure.
And a reminder about the premium podcast from My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. For as little as $2 a month, you can get extra episodes to this podcast. www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpoliticspremium.com